So I recently found four gold tier papers. And you might be wondering what the hell is a gold tier paper? Essentially, it is a papers designed for people aiming for a grade seven to nine. And this kind of links back to the aiming for grade nine papers that I, was, I did last year and earlier on this year as well. And a lot of people are asking, well, hang on, some of these questions don't feel like grade nine. So I want to preface this by saying that not all topics can be grade nine, if that makes sense. So this is for people aiming for grade nine. So the actual questions are between grade seven and grade nine. Fairly tricky ones. As you can see, it is a shorter test than usual. So it is a collection of questions rather than a test is the way I would like to word it. But again, what the main thing you need to learn from this video is my thought process. So I'm going to explain exactly what I'm thinking, why I'm thinking it as well. And you can use that to then apply it to the questions that you may get either this year or next year or whenever you do your GCSE exam. And that's really the important thing is the exam tests application. You will get questions that are completely different to this, completely different to everything you've done before. You need to be able to apply your knowledge. And that's what these videos, these next four papers are going to be all about applying your knowledge in order to get a grade seven or nine. So without further ado, let's jump straight into it. This diagram shows a cuboid with a bunch of letters. It tells me a few of the lengths, calculate the volume of the cuboid. So what I like to do is there is a method called the DICE method for approaching any kind of maths question. It does work in science as well, any kind of calculation. And this really works on well A-level maths as well. But D is always for diagram. So what you're gonna do is either draw a diagram or add to the diagram. So in this case, if you notice, I have a bunch of lengths, but they haven't actually illustrated them on the diagram. So the first thing I would personally do is say, okay, AB is seven, so I'd write down that this is seven centimeters. <clears throat> AF is five centimeters. And then we have FC, which is this diagonal length, is 15 centimeters. I is for identify. Now, identify will be essentially what the problem is asking you for and what they have given to you. So it says here, we need to calculate the volume of the cuboid. Now volume is when you multiply the three lengths together. So sometimes you might call them like width times length times depth. But the idea is, is we're going to have this width, so AB. So if you want, you can even sub this in. You can say AB times AF, so the height of the actual shape, times the, uh, well, the depth, right? So either AD or BC, depending on how you want to look at it. And that will give me the volume of the cuboid. So I do have these two things, but I don't have the final piece. I don't have the depth, so how long this shape is. And that is what we now know to calculate. So again, the process here is I start from the end. I say, okay, what are they asking me for? The volume, and I write out the equation for volume. Then I say, well, what have they given me? They've given me these three lengths, but which ones do I need? Well, I need the width, I need the height, but I need the length and they haven't given that to me. They've given me this weird kind of shape, well, sorry, this weird diagonal here. And from here, you can then identify exactly what length you need to work out, either BC or AD, because it's a cuboid, they're both the same length anyway. But now we can do step C, which is calculate. What we can do is actually attempt to calculate the answer. Now, there are two ways to solve this question, as with many things in maths. Both of them, though, are kind of the same thing. So the first one is 3D Pythagoras. The second one is using 2D Pythagoras, but you'll actually have to use it multiple times. So what do I mean by that? Well, as you can see, they've given me, I could make a right angle triangle like this, where we have the triangle going from F to C, then C to A, and then A to F. And what I can do then is work out what AC is, and then use that again as a triangle to work out what BC is because I have the diagonal length. 3D Pythagoras is the fastest way to do it, but it does confuse a lot of students. Just so you know, you don't technically need to use 3D Pythagoras. You can always break it up into 2D chunks. So I'm gonna do 2D uh, Pythagoras. So again, it's a method. We have one triangle going from A to F, F to C, C to A, and we have the height, we have the hypotenuse, and we want this um, third side here going from A to C. So what we can do is we can work out AC by going square root of 15 squared minus five squared. It should also be noted that although this says paper one, it's not a paper one in the sense that it's non-calculator. 
Uh, generally speaking, all of the grade nine stuff that I do, I'm going to use a calculator because it's just faster and I'm pretty sure you guys are capable of, um, you know, numeracy without a calculator, but that's 10 root two. So that gives me that length. And now I'm going to look at the triangle from A to C, which is the hypotenuse, C to B and uh, B to A. So that means BC is going to equal square root and we have the hypotenuse 10 root 2 squared minus 7 squared. Again, those of you that know how to do the 3D Pythagoras formula, uh, it is a bit uh, more difficult to see exactly what you need to use, but you of course can use it if you want. So I'm actually going to use the ANS button to help me out here. The ANS button just saves the previous answer in your calculator and we get square root 151. Uh, so let's say 12 point, so let's say three significant figures. This is my answer. Let's say 12.29 and we'll round it up afterwards. And then lastly, but certainly not least, we are going to uh, do the volume. This is my length BC, so I can put it in here. So that means my volume is just equal to AB, which is seven, multiplied by AF, which is five, multiplied by this 12.29. I'm probably just gonna use, again, the answer button to make it as precise as possible. So we have, uh, let's move over, seven times five times A and S, because that's my last answer in the calculator. We get 430 to three significant figures like so um yeah so centimeters cubed in terms of the answer they do give you a little bit of variation depending on how you did it so around 430 or 431 those are the two answers they give you in the mark scheme so hopefully that makes sense in terms of the working out again it is helpful to start from what they want and then work your way progressively further backwards more geometry so the diagram shows a solid cone so fairly standard looking thing it has a diameter of 24x, a height of 16x. Uh, curved surface area is 2160 pi. Find the, well, basically find the volume. Okie dokie. So there is a few key things here. Um, one thing which I always like to remind students is they never give you information you won't use. So I will use the 24x, the 16x, the 2160 pi. I'll use it all. And the second thing is, again, let's start with what they want. Well, Diagram wise, so the D and dice, we've actually already done it. I didn't actually go through what the E is. The E is evaluate. Basically, does your answer make sense? So 430, is that reasonable? Is it to three significant figures? Have we got the units? That's what we mean. The diagram's already done for us. Pretty cool. You might want to add one thing, which is, well, if you look at the formulas, they all use radius. So if you want, you could always just add your own little radius there. But other than that, the diagram is pretty good. I is identified. So we want the volume, and the volume is a third pi r squared h. So let's write that down. A third pi r squared h. So in this case, well, we have everything we need, really, technically, kind of. r squared is going to be 12x squared. And the height was 16x. If you look, the height is indeed the height. It's not the slanted length. Uh, 16x. So we could actually start to simplify this a wee bit. Just a wee bit. Pi, uh, 12 squared is 144 times 144x squared times. And again, in terms of your numeracy, I'm not going to uh, just test that just yet. What we're going to do is I'm going to times the numbers all together. So that is a third times 144 times 16, which gives me 768. I'm glad that's a whole number, makes my life a bit easier. Then of course we're gonna have the pi that's here, and then we're gonna have x cubed. So job done, right? Well, not really. There's no x in this answer, and it does say find the value where v is an integer, which means we can't have an x, because x is not technically an integer, we want an actual numerical answer. So we need to find out what x is. How can we do that? Well, we've used these pieces of information already, but we haven't used this equation and we haven't used this information yet. So we must have to use it. There's no way they'll give us information we don't need. And they also will have to give us enough information so the question's possible, right? I mean, that's kind of obvious. So we have to write an equation for the curved surface area of the cone. 
Okay, let's try that. Well, the curved surface area is pi r l, but we know it equals 2, 1, 6, 0 pi. So the curve 2, 1, 6, 0 pi equals pi r l. Well, pi, I know what pi is. r, I know what r is, it's 12x. But l is the slanted length, and I don't have that. Interesting. Well, and here's where the diagram and the, a real solid understanding of geometry helps. If I were to drag this arrow over, I could write it like this. I'm hoping you can see that this would actually be functionally the same thing, right? The height goes from the, the middle of the bottom of the cone all the way to the top, the point. Well, this slanted length now, if you look at it, it actually makes a right angled triangle. So we get to use Pythagoras again, how fun. So this slanted length here, all it's going to equal, um, I'm going to write L for now, and then I'm going to say L is equal to the square root of uh, 12x squared plus 16x squared. Like so. And again, using a calculator just to make uh, our lives a little bit easier, I would just bear in mind this is just 12 squared plus 16 squared then you add x squared on the end. So if I just do something like this, 12 squared plus 16 squared, that gives me 400. So this equals the square root of 400 x squared. Luckily, 400 is actually um, a square number. It's 20 x. So we know that L is equal to 20 x. So that means we can shove that now in place of L up here. So hopefully you're seeing the kind of thought process that's going on here equals, and then it's just a little bit of algebra, everyone's favorite, 12x times 20x. Well, good news, we can cancel out the pi's from both sides. Brilliant. Uh, 12x times 20x, we're going to have 2, 160 equals 12 times 20 would be 240x squared. Uh, divide both sides by 240. Let's be a little bit lazy, why not? Again, you should be able to do this all without a calculator as well. That would be 216 divided by 24, and you can simplify that as a fraction if you want. But again, I'm lazy, so let's do it equals x squared. So that means x is equal to three. Technically plus or minus three, but since x is a radius, it's a length, it has to be positive. So now finally, we can just shove this into here, and we are finally, finally, finally done is 768 pi times 3 cubed. So 768 times 27. Let, again, you can do this by hand, but you know, I'm, I, 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 just, I, just, I can't do it, boss. All right, 20,736 uh, pi. Now, if you notice, the actual value for v that they're looking for is an integer find the value of v, you would technically have to just write on the answer line 20, 7, 3, 6 as your technical final answer. That's another five marker, all done. Again, hopefully that makes sense. <clears throat> hopefully that dice strategy is working for you. Again, it's all about identifying what do they want and what have they given you. Once you do that and you really, you write it out for yourself, maths questions do become a lot easier. It is problem solving though. For example, using Pythagoras in this way, not really ever seen. You may have never seen that before, but it's up to you to say, okay, this actually looks like a right angle triangle. Let me try that. Tricky, I know, but that is the skill they expect. Okay, question number three. So again, more geometry. The diagram shows a solid hemisphere, so half of a sphere. The volume of the hemisphere is 250 over three pi. Work out the exact total surface area of this solid hemisphere. Given your answer is multiple pi, it does say non-calculator. Fine, I guess, let's do it without a calculator. So here, what you'd want to do is, okay, well, think about, again, we want the total surface area. The total surface area in this question is a little bit tricky. A little bit tricky because here it says the surface area of a sphere is four pi r squared. So you would be tempted to say that the surface area of the hemisphere is just half of that, right? So two pi r squared. The problem with that is remember that the surface area is the outer 
surface. I know, shocking, right? If I cut it in half, I'm actually only getting the outer surface here. I'm not taking into account this flat piece on top. So again, I have this ball. If I cut it in half, I'm only getting like a bowl shape for the surface area. So in order to add the top of it, I need to also add the area of this top shape here, which is of course a massive circle. So then it's add pi r squared. So in total, that's three pi r squared. Crazy, I know, right? But that's what we need to do. So in terms of, you know, identifying what we want, again, the diagram was done for us, hence we skipped that step. In terms of identifying what we need, uh, we are working on the surface area. We've got our equation, it looks really good. But we don't have r. And that's because we haven't used this information yet. So it tells me the volume of the hemisphere. So the volume of a hemisphere is just going to be exactly equal to half of the volume of a sphere. So instead of 4 over 3, it's going to be 2 over 3 pi r cubed. That bit stays the same because, again, with volume, we're looking at inside space. If you cut it off, it is exactly half because there's no new surface exposed uh, when you're talking about volume. And that should equal 250 over 3 pi. So the nice thing about this is I'm already seeing I can just cancel out the pi's. I can cancel out the threes because I could times both sides by three. So it's two r cubed equals 250. I could technically cancel that out, but I'm going to take it a bit slower because I know algebra is a little bit of a soft spot for some people. Divide both sides by two, you get r cubed is 125. And of course that means r is equal to five, is it in centimeters? It doesn't actually tell me, so I'm just going to say centimeters. It won't matter in the end anyway, but either way. Now we can just shove this straight back into this equation here. And that's it. 3 pi times 5 squared. So that becomes 3 pi times 25. So that is 75 pi. Ah, uh, it was centimeters. Perfect. Um, yeah, that was, that was pretty quick. That was not that bad. But again, although it's four marks, which is a lot of marks and there aren't many steps, it's this part that students will get stuck on. Because, and, it, and again, it's because it's relying on your knowledge of surface area. The surface area is everything you can touch. When I cut a sphere in half, I can now touch a new surface, which is this flat piece here. I have to add that on, okay? The reason why you don't with volume is because the volume is the inside space. So the inside space is exactly half of a normal sphere. But again, with the surface, it does change. Thelma spins a biased coin twice. The probability that it will come heads down both times is 0 0.09. Calculate the probability that it will come down tails both times. So here you might be thinking, okay, dice method, we have to use a diagram. How do you use a diagram? Well, keep in mind the diagram isn't necessarily a drawing of a coin. It could be a good old fashioned tree diagram. But this is, you know, heads, tails, followed by heads and tails. It doesn't have to be, you know, a drawing of the scenario. It can be an interpretation of it. So why is this Why is this useful in this case? Well, this really allows me to visualize where the probability is coming from. It tells me the probability that would come down heads both times is 0.09. Calculate the probability that would come down tails both times. So let's work out what I would need for that. Again, we've done the D in dice, the diagram. Well, tails both times would be going tails and tails. So it means I would have to do probability of tails multiplied by the probability of tails and that will give me my answer. Problem is, I don't have the probability of getting tails. Oops. So instead, what have they given me? So again, this is the identify step. Now we can kind of work out where well, we can identify what they've given us and write an equation for that. So here it says the probability that will come down heads both times. So that is heads followed by heads. Okay, so the probability of getting a head multiplied by the probability of getting a head again is equal to 0 0.09. So in other words, the probability of getting heads squared is 0 0.09. So the probability of getting a head is equal to the square root 
oh god, I'm sorry for the handwriting, of 0 0.09. Um, this I'm definitely going to use a calculator for because I want to. 3 over 10, so 0 0.3. Fantastic. Now I can actually fill in my diagram. So again, we're not finished with the calculate step. So we are on the calculate step, but we haven't done what we need to do yet. We need to do t, probability of t times probability of t. We've now got the probability of h, but why is that useful? Well, if I fill that into my diagram, what do you remember about probability tree diagrams? Well, across the branches should add up to one. So 0 0.3 plus this probability should equal one. So that is 0 0.7, and that's 0 0.7, and that's 0 0.7. So now, I can do 0 0.7 times 0 0.7, which is 0 0.49, and that is the probability of getting tails both times. This type of probability question really ruins a lot of students. They don't get it. Draw a tree diagram because it hopefully made it a hell of a lot easier for you to visualize. So again, dice, diagram. In pretty much every instance you want to do this, sure if you're multiplying two numbers, like what's two times four, you don't need to use a diagram. Not at this stage, but back in primary school you did. I identify what do they want you to know and what have they given you? Sorry, what do they want you to calculate or do and what have they given you? C, calculate, this is this step. Using your diagram and what you have, calculate some stuff in order to get towards the answer. And then lastly, E, evaluate. How do I evaluate this? Well, does it seem reasonable? Well, it's less than one. It's a positive number. So it could be a probability. Again, it doesn't mean you're going to say, yeah, this is definitely right, but my steps seem logical. I have the mark scheme, so of course I know it's logical, but that is the correct answer. A pendulum of length L has time period T seconds. T is proportional to the square root of L. The length of the pendulum is increased by 40%. Work at the percentage increase in the time period. So again, you can kind of look at this. A time period is the time it takes to swing from one side all the way back is one time period. And of course it has a length L centimeters. But the main thing here is we're going to write out a proportional relationship. So if T is proportional to the square root of L, if you want, you can also write this as T is equal to KL although in my opinion, that's not a necessary step. So we have now done the diagram stage again. I identified what have they given me. They've told me the relationship, which I've then converted into maths, which is generally speaking what you want to do. They give me that the length of the pendulum is increased by 40%. What's the percentage increase in the time period? This is a proportional question. It's just proportion. So again, a, a good way to think about this is use simpler terms. So if something is directly proportional, let's say hypothetically in this weird world, it was actually KL, and they said they doubled the length, what happens to the time period? Well, you can see that because L doubles, K is a constant, T must also double, okay? Well, in this case, they've actually got a square root around the L. Well, again, what happens if they times L by two? Well, T would now increase by the square root of two because it's inside the square root. So now, if we actually look at what, and I'm hoping you're seeing the point in me doing this, is to build up the complexity of the problem. You can do this in your head. Think, what's the most basic form of this question? Well, if it's just T equals L, if L doubles, T doubles. Cool. Then build more complexity. What about increased by 40%? Well, what is increasing by 40% as a multiplier? it means you're multiplying by 1.4. If you want, you can also say you're multiplying by 140%, you will get the same answer. So if I times L by 1.4, hopefully you can see that T will increase by the square root of 1.4. Again, if you do times 140%, it'd be the same thing, times square root 140%. And that's all you have to do, okay, is well, times it by that. It tells me here that, okay, it doesn't say anything about the change in time. So yeah, work out the percentage increase. Well, all we need to do now is either do one of these two things, square root of 1.4 or square root 140%. So get my calculator out. If I do square root 
What does that mean? It gives me an answer of 1.18. So that means my multiplier is 1.18. What does that mean? It means it's an 18% increase for T. If I do it with the 140%, watch what happens. It's the same, it's gonna be the same answer, just given in a slightly different form. Square root of 140% is 1.18. So it's an 18% increase. Again, why, why is 1.18 an 18% increase? For the same reason back here. One is the original amount. Anything above one is extra, is an increase. So 1.1 is a 10% increase. 1.01 is a 1% increase. Anything below is a decrease. So all we're doing is taking away one and it gives us our percentage increase. Here's a right angled triangle. More geometry, this is uh, fascinating. <laughs> X minus two is a height and an X in terms of the base. Measurements are in centimeters. Area of the triangle is two and a half centimeters squared. If you want, you can like highlight this information. Find the perimeter, answer the three SF, must show the working out. Wonderful. So. First of all, diagram. Well, we have the diagram. If you want, you could add that this is 2.5 centimeters squared, just to kind of illustrate that everything's on there. Up to you. Now, identify. We want to work out the perimeter. How do you work out the perimeter? Well, you take the three sides and you add them all together. So, obviously we can't do that just yet because we don't know uh, the third side. Interesting. If you want, you could call the third side like y, for instance. So I know that my perimeter in the end is going to be x minus 2 plus x plus y. So that's going to be 2x minus 2 plus y. Now you might think, well, what if I used uh, Pythagoras? And we will use Pythagoras. Would that help right now? Probably not. Instead, so the reason why I say that is if you look at what happens when I do Pythagoras, we're going to get a fairly complicated expression in my square root. That is going to be a bit of a pain to square root afterwards. It's, in my opinion, easier just to work out what x is first. But you know what, now we've done this. If we expand those brackets, we get x squared minus 4x plus 4 plus x squared. So it would be the square root of 2x squared minus 4x plus 4, which, fun fact, is actually... It is technically possible, but you have to use something called binomial expansion, and the expansion would go on forever. So we'll leave it like that for now. So let's think, okay, we're stuck a bit here. What, else, what other information do they give us? Identify some other information. The area. Well, how do I work out area? Well, it's a half times the base, which is x, times the height, which is x minus 2. And I know that equals 2.5. Now we can proceed with the C, the calculation part of this, where we're actually going to get some numbers out. So, again, with the identify, you identify what they've given you, what they, what the end goal is, what the, um, what they want you to calculate. C, calculate. You're going to start working through this. To make this a bit easier, I'm going to times both sides by two to get rid of the half. We get x, x minus two, equals five. Um, okay, let's expand x squared minus two x equals five. So to solve this, it's a quadratic. So we're going to move everything to one side and then we're going to either factorize or um, use the quadratic formula. Can we factorize? No. So that kind of makes it a bit simpler for us. What we're going to do then is we're going to go to menu, equation slash func, polynomial, polynomial degree of two, we're going to put one, Minus two. Again, if you want to just use the quadratic formula, you're more than welcome to. Yep, okay, so it doesn't give us a thing. So 3.45, let's call it. X equals minus 1.45. And now we need to decide which one is it. Well, if you look, X is actually the length or the base of this triangle, so it can't be negative. So x is, is indeed equal to 3.45. Let's sub that into, well, here, and sub it into here to work out the rest of our values. So y is equal to the square root of 2 times 3.45 squared minus 4, 3.45 plus 4, 
all square rooted. Love maths. Um, menu, back down to number one. We have square root, we have two, three point four five squared, squared, there we are, minus four, three point four five plus four, three point seven four. Look at that, beautiful. And now that means that finally for our perimeter, if we add all that up together, two, three point four five. Minus 2 plus 3.74 gives me the final. That's a six mark question. Wow. It's not actually that much, but you know, it's what it is. Uh, nope. Minus 2 plus 3.74. Bish bash bosh. And it says to give it to 3SF, so 8.64. Uh, in terms of the answer, it does give you a range because, again, we have to do some rounding. Anything between 8.63 and 8.65 is accepted, so we've bisected it perfectly. So, again, uh, that was the calculate step. In terms of evaluate, well, we've given it to 3SF. We've given it a centimetres. The number is, reason is reasonable. You might have also noticed we did technically do a mini evaluation over here, right? We said, well, which one is it? Is it this or is it this? And we disregarded this because it's negative. So in these big six mark questions or five mark questions, you might do multiple dice steps. So you might do dice multiple times. Like with the area, I've got a diagram, I've identified the equation, I've calculated it, and now I'm evaluating it. So we are doing dice multiple times, technically speaking, if it doesn't line up perfectly. Well, here we go. There are 10 pens in a the box. There are X red pens and the other pens are blue. Jack takes at random two pens from the box, find an expression in terms of X for the probability that Jack takes one pen of each color. So again, this is another thing that students seem to struggle with. Uh, so good old fashioned diagram. We have 10 pens and it says they're X red and uh, others are blue. I'm gonna say for now, what if we had six red and therefore four blue? So we have red, 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 blue, 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 blue. How would you work this out? Well, again, what you're going to do is there are two possibilities, right? One pen of each color, you could either get a red, you know what, I just realized I wrote R. There we are. There we... You could either get a red and then a blue, or you could get a blue and then a red, right? There's two possibilities. And what we need to do is work out the probability of each one and add them together. Why? Because it's the word is or. I can get a red and a blue, so that means we're going to multiply, or, hence the add, blue and a red. The word and means multiply, or means add. And in this case, well, it'd be quite, it'd be fairly self-explanatory. Red times blue would be six out of, out of 10 times that. Now, what's the difference here? The difference is, I don't know how many red pens I have. So in this situation, what would I write? Well, I would write, for picking a red pen, six out of 10, because there are six red pens. Well, in this case, there are X red pens, so I'm going to do X over 10, okay? So instead of six, X. What would I do next? Well, then I'm getting a blue, but that would be four over nine, because there is one fewer pen, I've already taken one out. So that over nine exists, but how would I illustrate taking blues? Bear in mind there aren't actually four blues. Well, if it look, it, how do I work out there are four blue pens when I use this example? Well, when there's X red pens, the rest of them are blue, so you do 10 minus six. Well, in this case, there are X red pens, so we're going to do 10 minus X instead. Expanding this, we can have, well, X times 10X would be 10X, X times minus X would be minus X squared, over 90. The same thing again. Blue times red. Well, how many blue pens are there? Well, again, in this case, there were four because we did 10 minus the number of red pens. So it's going to be 10 minus um, X in this case. And that's going to be out of 10 because there are 10 pens in total. Multiply by, well, how many red pens would there be if I did it here? Well, there'd be six, but in this case, we have X red pens. So X over nine. So I'm hoping you can see why the whole diagram thing was 
uh, useful, why it was important, because it really did help with this question. And again, we get 10x minus x squared over 90. Adding those together, and this is where things eh, might get a little bit tricky, the denominator will stay the same because we already have the same denominator. We'll have 10x minus x squared. And I would do this in two separate steps personally. Plus 10x minus x squared, just because I'm very paranoid. So that gives me 20x minus 2x squared over 90. Are we done? Well, if you notice here, it says simplest form. So you have to evaluate. Well, I could divide everything here by 2, which gives me 10x minus x squared over 45. Remember, when you simplify a fraction, when you divide the top and bottom by the same number, it does affect everything. So when I divide the numerator by 2, it's not just 20x divided by 2, it's 20x divided by 2 and 2x squared divided by 2. It's everything. But that is our answer. 5 marker. Again, drawing that diagram, following that dice method, really does help with questions like this. Okay, they've given us like a war and peace novel to read. So we have a clay model, it's mathematically similar. So I'll come back to that in a second. Model has a base area of six. Statue will have a base area of 253.5. Mark uses two kilograms of clay to make the model. Clay is on 10 kilo bags. How much does he need to make the real thing? So here, I mean, what do, what do we need to work out? It says how much, well, sorry. How many bags of clay will Mark need to buy? So in order to work that out, I need to know how much clay he needs. And then I need to divide it by the amount of clay in each bag, which is 10. So that I've identified, you know, what they want me to work out. I need to work out the amount of clay he needs. Now, this is a very tricky question because of the way it links. But again, that's how much clay he needs. So how can I work that out? Well, brings me back to this mathematically similar model. The model will have a base area of six. So I'm just going to draw, what should we make it a model of? You know what, let's just make it a big circle. Actually, like a cone shape, yeah? Sure, why not, right? Actually, you know what, screw it. I'm just going to get rid of this. I'm just going to draw the, the bottom bit. That is the base area. The actual statue will have this base area. So this is a base area of six centimeters squared. This is a base area of 253.5 centimeters squared. Because it says it's mathematically similar, what that means is this model is just a scaled down version of what the real thing will be. So if I times this model by something, I will get the actual dimensions of the real thing. Um, you know, I'm, I'm gonna make it like a little Thing with this. What other information that they given me? Well, it takes two kilograms of clay to make the model, and we want to work out how much clay it will take to make the real thing, because that's how much clay he needs. So why is this interesting? The reason why this is interesting is because of what the scale factors are, what they actually are. What does, this is a mass, you've never heard of a mass scale factor, because it is the exact same as a volume scale factor. The reason for this is the volume of material that you use is proportional to how much mass it has, right? So if you think about it, you know, something that's twice as big, we use twice as much material. So how do we do this? Well, as you can see here, we're going to work out an area scale factor. So the area scale factor it's just equal to 253.5 over 6. Which again, get our calculators out. hundred sixty-nine over 4. So now, because I want the volume scale factor, how can I get there? Well, you can't go straight from area to volume. So what you have to do is go down to the length scale factor which is just the square root of this um, monstrosity. We square root it. I think that's just 13 over 2, isn't it? Yeah, 13 over 2. And then for the volume scale factor, you then cube it. 
I'll confess I don't know what that is cubed. So let's use answer cubit 2197 over 8. So in terms of the tricky parts of this question here, it definitely has to do with the whole maths thing. The reason why they expect you to know it is because of density. Because density is mass over volume, you're expected to realize that density times volume is mass, which means anything that happens to the volume happens to the mass as well. So if the volume times is by 10, the mass times is by 10. So in terms of the clay he needs, We're going to take the amount that he required for the model, so 2, and we're going to times it by uh, the scale factor, 2197 over 8, which will just give me 2197 over 4. Now, to actually work out the final answer, we take that number, 2197 over 4, and we're dividing it by 10. So here, I'm going to times it by 2, with that, divide by 10. Uh, how many bags of clay? Now, again, there's another thing here, right? So he needs 54.925 bags of clay. Well, not really. He needs 55 because 54 will not be enough. And you can't buy 0.925 of a bag. That for a three mark question is actually a bit brutal. I'm going to be I'm going to be honest with you. Quite a few steps, especially with I mean, maybe if they just asked for how much clay you needed, but then making it also the number of bags and things like that. It's a bit, bit harsh. The number of bees in a beehive at the start of a year n is pm. The number of bees in the beehive at the start of the following year is given by this mathematical equation. At the start of 2015, there were 9,500 bees in the beehive. How many bees will there be at the start of 2018? So the way this equation works is, let me illustrate it to you. The population in 2016 will equal 1.05 population of 2015 minus 250, right? So the population in the next year equals 1.05 times the population in this year. The reason why I'm starting at 2015 is because it tells me how many were in the beehive in 2015. So you might think, well, this is a bit tedious because I have to go all the way up to 2018. However, this is a process called iteration. And there is a very fancy trick you can use. So. Allow me to show you. Here's what I do. Whenever I see, if you ever see this kind of expression where it has like an n plus 1 and an n, so it could be x n plus 1 or whatever, do this. Start 2050, because what you want to do is you need to repeat this calculation for then 2017 and 2018, right, where you re-sub in new values. So you would get your answer for 2016, sub it in again to get your answer for 2017, sub it in again to get 2018. That's tedious. Remember, you can use the answer button, the ANS button, in order to save what you've just put in. Okay? So, I'm going to start at 9,500, and I'm going to press the equals button. So now my ANS button is my last answer. Then I'm going to put in, I'm going to write the exact same calculation, but instead of PN, I'm going to put ANS. What this will do after the first time is it will do exactly what I've written here for 2016. 2015 is already 9,500, so I get 9712.5. Now remember what the answer button does. It automatically is now going to sub in the 2016 value in place over here. So instead of retyping the whole thing on my calculator, it automatically shoves it in. Boom, there we go, 9935.625. And again, 2018. So press equals again because it's just going to take this value and resub it in for me instead of me typing out the whole thing. Now it does say uh, how many bees will there be, and how many bees will there be? Um, so I would just round this to the nearest whole number because of course you can't have 0 0.906 of a bee. So I'd say 1016. Oh no 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 sorry, seven zero to the nearest whole number. And that right there is three marks. And they, you get a mark basically for each iteration you get correct. 
Now, again, using that method where you just sub it in using the ANS button is really powerful because you get those three marks in about 10 seconds. Well, let's say 20 seconds, really quick. But again, understand why I'm doing that and why it works. It's because all you're doing in this question is resubbing in values. Final question of this batch of questions, a little bit of coordinate geometry again. I know geometry, 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 it's what it was. So, find an equation of the line that passes through C and is perpendicular to AB. Thank God they've given you the diagram. Helps you out a lot. Um, I will say that this kind of question could have no diagram if it was in A level, but you guys aren't in A level yet, so let's leave that as it is. Again, we have a diagram, but let's add to it. We want a line that goes through AB, so AB, and C. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to draw a line like this. Crikey. It should be it should be perpendicular, so let's do it like that. Why does this help? Well, it helps visualize what you need. So what do you need? So this is the identify part now. The equation of a straight line is y equals mx plus c. So let's identify what we need. The gradient. Okay. The second thing we need is just any coordinate. Well, I do have a coordinate. It says it passes through C. So the coordinate they want me to use is five minus one. It's the coordinates of C. Again, when, you, when I say any coordinate, it's any coordinate that lies along this line. I don't know this coordinate, the point of intersection, and working out is not really possible at this stage, but I do have the coordinate C that it passes through. What about the gradient? Well, again, we've identified what we need. We have the equation. We have these two things, and we've identified what we've got. Now we can calculate, because there is a special relationship with the gradient of perpendicular lines. If I work out the gradient of AB, I can take the negative reciprocal to work out the gradient of this line that goes through C. So MAB, let's call it, is equal to the difference in Y and difference in X. Well, look at what they've given me. What are the coordinates of B? Well, it's a Y intercept, which means X has to be zero because it's along the X equals zero line. It's along the axis and four. Likewise here, they've given me an X intercept where uh, X is minus two. And of course, Y has to be zero because it's along this flat line at Y equals zero. So difference in Y over difference in X, it's four minus zero over zero minus minus two. Four minus zero is four, zero minus minus two is two. So the answer is two. Negative reciprocal. So M of my line is when I take the negative reciprocal, again, you flip and make negative. So I change the sign. Two can be written as two over one. So that is going to be negative a half. Now I can sub this into y equals mx plus c. Minus a half x plus c. Again, I'm not done. I need to actually work out what c is. Well, you use the coordinate for that. When x equals 5, y equals negative 1. So we have negative 1 equals negative a half times 5 plus c. So we have minus 1 equals uh, negative 2.5 plus c, add 2.5 to both sides, we get 1.5 equals c, which is also 3 over 2, by the way. So if you want to write this out fully, we normally use fractions instead of decimals, half x plus 3 over 2 as our final answer. As I mentioned, there are three more papers after this that I'm thinking of doing, depending on how much you guys want this, how useful this is to us. Uh, I do like the shorter papers, short and sweet. Um, there's also papers like this for grades, uh, so this is seven to nine, there's also grades for six to eight, and five to six, and four to six, and four to five as well. Uh, I will do the four to five ones for the foundation people, at least assuming that's what you guys want, but I don't know about the six to seven ones to be honest, because I don't know how useful that would be to some of you guys, but let me know in the comments. Uh, other than that, I'll leave the link to not only this paper in the description, but the previous aiming for grade nines and grade fives that I've already done in the description just so you can quickly access them for more practice. Have a really good day and I'll see you in the next one.